Thank you. Is this working? Can you? No? That's only for the camera. Oh. Okay, I'd better speak up then, hadn't I? Um, <laughs> that was me, I was going to mumble into my microphone, hoping you'd hear me at the back. Um, evening, everybody. Um, my name's Rachel McCollin. Um, I'm one of two Brummies in the room, I think. <laughs> you wouldn't believe we came on different trades and turned up at the same time. Um, I run a web design agency called Compass Design in Birmingham, so you've probably never heard of us at all, because um, we're the other side of Watford, Watford Gap. Um, but in Increasingly, I actually spend more of my time writing. Um, I've not long finished a book on WordPress mobile development, which I will take no hesitation in plugging, and I've brought some copies up to sale if anybody'd like to buy it. Um, and I just yesterday signed contracts to actually write two more books. So um, meanwhile, I'm passing on lots of development work to the rest of my team because I've got less and less time to do that. But uh, I really enjoy writing because actually when I'm writing is when I get to do some of my most experimental work because clients don't the clients I have, I don't have people like Toyota and stuff like that, the clients I have don't generally want you to do stuff that's really <laughs> fun and new and modern because they haven't got the budget or the understanding. But when I'm writing, I can play and experiment and come up with new ideas, so I like that. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about using WordPress to build a web app. Um, following on from Jack's talk, um, I feel like how can I follow on from that? Because his theme is fantastic, and I'm going to be playing with that a lot. Um, but what I'm going to be looking at, taking you through, is the process I used to take an existing responsive site and create a mobile theme from that to be used as a web app, which complements the main site. Um, so the site itself is very much based on content and information. The web app is about a process. As Jack and I had this conversation beforehand. What's the difference between a web app and a website? And I think it's about the fact that a web app supports a process or an activity. People use a web app to do something, not just to get information or find stuff out. They don't use it to consume so much as to actually carry out some sort of process. Um, so. Um, that's it, you have to swipe to do this. Right, this is only the second time I've used my phone and my iPad together to give a presentation, so I always worry the technology's not going to work, but thank God it is. Um, before I start, um, I'm going to, there's lots of links in here. Um, you don't have to write them all down because at the end I'll give you a link to the slides on SlideShare or on my blog and I'll give you a QR code so you can go straight into that. Unfortunately, it's flash based, so if you're using an iPhone, you won't actually be able to see it, but you can follow the link and so forth and see it when you're back at your desk. I'm really hoping SlideShare get round that at some point, but two years on from the first time I did it, they still haven't. So that's just, I'll put that in there so I don't forget to tell you. Um, so why would you want to build a web app um, as against a native app? Um, I imagine those, most of us here are web developers as against app developers. Are there any, anybody in the room who's primarily an app? developer, a native app developer rather than a web developer. Don't be embarrassed. Um, right, so you're probably fairly receptive to the idea of web apps. Um, I think web apps are largely the future of apps, particularly as the whole mobile ecosystem grows and becomes better in terms of the handsets that are out there actually realistically competing with the iPhone and with Android and getting better Android handsets and so forth. I think more and more clients are going to be wanting to develop apps that you can target multiple browsers, multiple multiple devices without the time and expense of actually developing lots of different versions, without going through the various app stores, without giving Apple a cut and all the rest of it. Um, I think the fact that they're platform agnostic makes it much more efficient. It means you don't have to learn different programming languages to write different apps for different devices. You can just use good old HTML. Um, and it also means that if you're the users of your app, like me, never update their apps on their phone. My phone's got to the point where it's not got enough memory to actually update my apps. So I have to plug it into my Mac to do it, and I never plug it into my Mac. So it's at the moment, I think it's got about 118 updates, the little thing yelling at me every time I look at it. Um, so if you built a a, a native app that, that's got a massive update that I would be really benefiting from. I'm sorry, I'm not actually looking at it at the moment. I'm probably looking at the old version, unless it's the WordPress app. That's the one I do keep updated. Um, whereas, obviously, if you're building a web app, you update it, you roll it out, straight there. 
not waiting for it to go through the app store, not waiting for it to go through any processes that don't belong to you, that belong to the, the, the phones or the operating systems, and you're not waiting for people to download it either. Um, it's also more SEO friendly. Um, people aren't going to find native apps via a Google search. Now obviously they are going to find them through if they're searching in their relevant app store and they ain't going to find your web app that way. But it might be that people who are looking for what it is you've got to offer are actually more likely to be looking in Google. Um, and they, they might be wanting, for example, to buy something. You could create a web app that helps them do that. A lot of um, e-commerce stores you know, have got mobile versions of their site that are effectively web apps. Um, and if people are finding that on Google, you can optimize your SEO yourself and you have control over that with a web app. You don't have any control over how that works in the iTunes store. You don't have any control over where they're going to put you in the listings and all the rest of it. Um, it's in the app store rather. So there are advantages. Obviously, it all depends on the context and on what the purpose of the app is. If you need to sell the app, obviously a native app is going to be the best way to go. You're not going to make millions with Angry Birds if you stick it on the web. But if you want to sell through your app, as against selling the app itself, you might find you actually get a bigger audience by using a web app. So that's my little web app, web app, web app spiel, why I think they're good. So I'm going to take you through the process um, of building a web app from an existing responsive site. Now this is a site that I built for a fictitious ice cream parlour. Um, I built this because I needed a site to use for a tutorial running through my book and I thought ice cream parlour, I've not done one of those and that'd be quite fun. Um, and I actually, um, it supposedly belongs to my great granddad, he actually ran a chip shop but I thought an ice cream parlour would be more fun. Um, and he was called Lou Carbarelli, I thought Carbarelli's ice cream parlour, yeah we'll go with that. So. It actually started as a desktop site, because the whole point is it's a desktop only site and take the user through the process of making it responsive. When you get to this stage, it is a responsive site. And I think it's a good idea if you're building a web app to actually have a responsive site as well. Because if somebody wants to switch to the main site as against the desktop site when they're in the web app, so if they want to consume content instead of carrying out a process, they click on that link to switch to the main site, they don't get a tiny shrunken version of your desktop site on their small screen, they get a nice responsive site. And you can also use your existing responsive styling as a starting point for your mobile theme, which I'll talk you through in a moment. So that's the responsive site as it is at the moment. It's got um, a different layout from the desktop site, the call to action is bigger, nice and easy to tap. The menu, there's a top menu with only four links in it, so that they're nice and easy to tap. And the main menu that's on the desktop top site is actually down in the footer. Um, so that's our starting point and what I'm going to take you through first is how to build the, the layout or how I built the layout for this particular web app. So I'm going to talk you through very briefly because Jack's already covered this, creating a mobile theme based on that responsive theme, removing any unwanted content, um, that's a shame it doesn't turn around landscape on the phone. Um, changing the site title because I, I don't want Carbarelli's as my title, I want Ice Cream Sunday Builder because that's what the web app does. Um, changing and styling the navigation so it looks more app-like, it's buttons instead of normal navigation bar and some more styling around the layout. And then the next stage which I'll go through after this is adding some web app functionality to it and I'll talk about some of the plugins that you can use to do that. So that's the design for the web app. So that's quite different from the responsive site. It's got the same basic background, but it's taken out a lot of the content. So you've got different navigation content and structure. You've got buttons instead of next to each other navigation, no homepage content, and a different site title. But at the same time, it's built on the same site and the same database, so you can't actually strip out the homepage content, you can't remove it, because you need people to have that if they're going to the desktop or the, the responsive site. So, I started off by um, using a mobile theme, um, and what I did for that was I took the, the styling for the responsive <coughs> Um, the, the media queries basically and use those to replace the layout styling for the desktop. So you, you make a duplicate of your existing style sheet and strip out all the stuff that's desktop only. Now this works a lot better if you're working mobile first 
because obviously your desktop then would be in your media queries. Not many of us are actually working mobile first at the moment. Is anybody here working mobile first or do you tend to put media queries for smaller devices? I talk about it a lot but I haven't actually started doing it yet because a lot of the work I get hired to do is working with existing desktop sites and making them responsive and that's what I'm doing here. So it's a slightly more complicated process because you have to weed out the layout for desktop. But I went through the star sheet and did that. I actually used a plugin, I used the WordPress mobile pack as my switcher. Um, now, I don't actually think it's as good as the switcher that you talked about, but I'm not sure whether that was available when I did this. Um, but WordPress mobile pack is mainly used as a plugin to make your site mobile out of the box. It comes with its own themes that you can just switch on. What I did was I installed the plugin, I deleted those themes and I set it to actually switch to my own mobile theme which you can do with with a lot of those um, mobile plugins. Um, and then I used the existing theme and edited it and I'll talk you through a little bit of that in a moment. So what you'll see here, really fuzzy picture I'm afraid on here, um, the mobile switcher it just gives you an option to pick your mobile theme there, and I've called it Carbarelli's Mobile, this theme. So it's using that instead of one of the, um, the WordPress mobile pack defaults. So the next stage was having um, edited the style sheet for layout and stripped out the desktop stuff, was to remove other content that isn't needed. Um, the home page content, I took that out by creating a new um, template file, home.php, and taking the loop out of that. So all that has is your header and your footer and any widgets. And then it means that the actual content in the database for the home page is still there. So if you go back to the main theme, you get all your home page content. But if you're in this mobile theme, on the home page, the content isn't displayed because the loop isn't calling it because it's not there. So that's what it's looking like at this, page, to this stage. Not particularly nice and a bit small. Um, so the next stage was to change the site description. Now, there's different ways you could go about this, um, but in, in this case I used, um, here there's, there's nothing, there's just a logo, and in my um, web app, I want Ice Cream Sunday Builder. So I used the site description for that. Now, in the main site, that's actually hidden using CSS. So it's there for screen readers, but it's it's off to the side using absolute positioning, which I'm sure most of you have done at some point. Um, so that's how that's invisible on the main site. On the mobile site, it's visible. Um, and I changed the description to Ice Cream Sunday Builder. Now, this isn't actually a perfect way to do it. I mean, I just did this because that was all that was needed for this site. But I think it might actually be better alternatives. You could use the site name for one version of the site and the site description for another. Or even better, I think, you could add a theme options screen. And in that theme options um, settings, you could have title of your mobile site, title of your, your desktop site. And so instead of actually calling up the, the, the site description from WordPress, it would be calling up whatever you put in your theme options in your mobile theme instead of the site description. So that now is getting closer. It's called Ice Cream Sunday Builder. Um, the next stage was to change the navigation. So I simply created another menu using the WordPress menus um, admin, um, called that web app. And then in the mobile theme, replace the code calling the primary navigation menu with code specifically calling that web app menu. Again, that's something you touched on. This is one way to do it. You did it a different way, which is probably better than mine, but this is just how I did it here. Um, so I just replaced that code there. Um, and I restyled those buttons. So instead of just being squares next to each other, they look more like buttons. So I've added um, rounded corners, I've changed the colours, I've changed the hover states and so forth using CSS. And then you get that, which is looking much closer to our design. Basically just using a bit of CSS. Um, 
The remaining things, there's just a bit of styling around these social media icons. Um, the address is restyled because in the, the main site it's actually where that title Ice Cream Sunday Builder is and it's just been moved down with CSS. The footer text is restyled and then using the plugin I've added a link to the main site. For some bizarre reason it actually says switch to our mobile site here so I don't know what the plugin is doing there. <laughs> should say switch to our main site, not desktop site, because it's not a desktop site. If you're on a mobile, you're switching to a responsive main site, not a desktop site. So that's how I've built the layout, taking a responsive theme and then turning that into a mobile theme. The next stage is to add some web app functionality. Um, now the functionality of this particular web app is, is quite limited. So I'll look at some other options and plugins and so forth that you can use for web apps as well. Um, but what I did for this particular app was I added it to basic e-commerce with PayPal. It's not a full-blown e-commerce site. It uses a form that's linked to PayPal. Um, and I, I added a map in there as well. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the extra options and sort of where things are going in terms of what you can access through mobile browsers now and what some of the possibilities might be in the future. Um, so, I told you there was going to be a big list of links. These are some of the, the plugins that I think could be useful for web apps. And a lot of them are plugins that you might use for desktop sites as well. But these are all about adding process-based functionality to a site. So, for example, if you're, if you're building a web app to support an event, um, there's an Eventbrite plugin that works really well for helping people book onto that event. You could build your web app around that plugin for when people, prior to the event, so people are booking in. And then there's another plugin called Events Manager, which you can use during the event to help people actually find out what's going on. So you could build a web app that is designed to help people depending on whether you know what stage you are at the event beforehand or afterwards and that gives them the, the functionality to find out what's happening when what's coming up next and so forth I've actually been working for the last couple of years on a personal project that keeps getting put on hold called glastolineup.com um, and it's it's basically for people at Glastonbury um, and it tells you what's happening next and um, what I'm the next stage is to add geolocation to it. So it finds out where you are at Glastonbury and tells you what's happening next at the stage nearest to you. And then you can upload photos of what you've seen. You can add reviews and that sort of thing. So there's loads of stuff you can do around events. Um, the only problem with that is one of my mates actually pointed out to me that nobody takes smartphones to Glastonbury because of the battery life. They all take their old Nokias and stuff. So, but it's fun anyway. <laughs> It's a fun thing to build. Um, and the next thing that's a big thing is mobile commerce. So building a web app that's designed to sell really, really increases the, the target audience for selling whatever the product is that you or your client is trying to sell. I mean, I do all of my online shopping via the Amazon app on my mobile. And something that I talk to my clients a lot about if they're doing e-commerce is, is making good use of mobiles and actually encouraging people to buy from them. And when they're out places, showing people their mobile site and encouraging them to buy on the spot from their mobile site and so forth. So there's a whole load of... of plugins for WordPress around e-commerce. One that I like is Jigo Shop because that, that's an e-commerce plugin but it also there's a range of themes especially developed for Jigo Shop and um, a lot of those are responsive. Some of them you have to pay for, some of them are free. Free ones are responsive as well. So it means that you've got a mobile shop sort of out of the box as it were but you don't have to go down the whole the whole full-blown e-commerce route. Um, for a subscription-based site, S2 Member's good. Gravity Forms I use a lot because it's responsive. Um, it's basically responsive because it's fluid. It uses percentage widths for the, for the form fields. And so you put it into a responsive site and there you've got a responsive form. It's really, really useful. And if you've got a developer license for it, you can link into PayPal and various other things as well. Um, and I actually, I, I use Gravity Forms with this particular site. Um, and then there's another one which I haven't used called WordPress Ultra Simple PayPal Shopping Cart. I don't know if anybody's used that, but the title attracted me. I thought, oh, if that's ultra simple, maybe it's a bit less, less bloated than some of the big ones like WP Commerce. So those are some useful plugins for those functions. There's also geolocation and maps. Now, 
I haven't found a plugin yet that actually does what I want it to with geolocation because I haven't found a plugin yet that finds exactly where the user is and then compares that to a location that you've already defined. There's plugins that do one, there's plugins that do the other and I haven't found anything that does both. So if anybody would like to write one, I'd definitely use it. Um, because you can do this with a phone. I mean, we recently developed a site for a plumber um, and they wanted, they got they had different offices and they wanted people to see a number depending on where they were, tap, ring the number, ring the local office and, and that was it. And that was all they got on their website. Um, so that sort of thing could be really useful for businesses that are very location based and want people to be able to find them. It'd also be great for my Glastonbury website as well. Um, so I'll be using MapPress because um, that's got quite a nice interface with this particular site. Social media is obviously another one that's really good for web apps. If you're building a site that's, um, that's a community-based site, um, making that responsive is, is a really useful thing to do because it means people can use it wherever they are. They're not going to be sitting at their desktops. You know, how many people use Facebook on their mobile now? So if you're building something similar, making sure you're using, social, using a responsive site. BuddyPress, I find if you put BuddyPress into a responsive site, it's not bad. It needs a bit of playing with. But I'm told that the next release of BuddyPress is going to be responsive, which is great news. But the problem is the people behind that, the team behind that are struggling to, to get it done because they're all volunteers. And so I am um, sort of keep saying, is this going to happen soon? I suppose I ought to get involved and help. But I'm too busy, sorry. Um, but yeah, BuddyPress, I think, is going to... It's going to be big in terms of responsive. And then photography is another one that these two plugins that I've mentioned here are actually both Photo Smash and iDump are both linked to third party services or third party native apps. So they are not ideal because up until very recently you couldn't actually upload photos via the browser on your mobile. One of the things that iOS 6 does do, forget the fact that everybody hates the Maps app, what you can do in mobile Safari now is you can upload photos. Um, so for example, if you're building a community site where people might want to upload a profile picture, or if you're building a gallery-based site or a portfolio-based site, people can now upload photos on their mobile if they're using mobile Safari and if they've taken the plunge and upgraded to iOS 6. So those are just a few of the wide range of plugins that could be useful to add functionality for a web app. So going back to my Ice Cream Sunday Builder, I use gravity forms on this one to add a form. You probably won't be able to even see that as <laughs> the, the gravity forms screen, but that just sort of shows you how I did that. And then this shows you what you get. So I then built a page that, where I inserted that form, which is dead easy in gravity forms. You just click the little forms button. Um, and this is the form that you've got. Now, what I've done here is um, I've used a lot of select boxes because one of the things that's really important when you're building a web app, because a web app is going to have a lot of interaction in it because it's about your users doing something and completing a process as against reading and consuming. There's going to be a lot of forms, there's going to be a lot of fields, there's going to be a lot of times when you're asking them to input things, choose things, whatever. The UX of that is really important because typing on a mobile is a pain and people don't want to do it any more than they absolutely have to. So some of the tips that I would say is, I mean, firstly, think about the size of your buttons and anything that people have to tap. Um, the Apple guidelines say they should be at least 44 pixels square, any tappable area, because that's roughly the size of a thumb. Um, so as Luke Rablewski puts it in mobile first, one thumb and half an eye, or one thumb and one eye, because people are watching the telly and they're also using your app at the same time, because that's how a lot of people browse these days. They're not out on the train looking at their mobile site, they're actually sitting, sitting at home chatting to their mates or watching the telly. Um, so make your buttons nice and big and tappable, and other links as well. Something that a lot of websites don't do is actually using the correct virtual keyboard. And when you're Put it, when you're coding a field, you specify what type of field it is and it would automatically access the correct keyboard. So, for example, on, on um, 
iOS, you've got the text keyboard, which is the default, you've got the numerical keyboard, you've got the URL keyboard and the email keyboard. So if you're asking somebody to put their email address in, make sure that you're coding it in a way that they will actually get that email keyboard up and they don't have to keep switching back and forth to get dots or apps or anything like that. It just makes it easier. Using select boxes where possible. So if there's anything where you're asking people to type in text, but you could actually just give them a choice, or you might give them a choice and then have an other box because the vast majority of people are going to select out of this range of things. Use a select box because as you'll see here, that's dead easy to work with and to tap on. So they just tap on the select box, pick what they want, and they're there. Whereas typing it in, they're likely to get it wrong. Your data is going to be a mess. You might not know what it is they're actually putting in. You're getting inconsistencies. Um, another thing is is accessing autofill. Um, if you specify when you're adding um, input fields um, where people have to put their contact details, if you give them a name, if you um, specify the name attribute, they it will and give it email or um, full name or first name or last name or address or phone, I think it is, it will automatically present you with a little autofill button when, when the user's in completing the form. And when they tap on that, it just automatically fills in all the fields. It does it on desktop as well. But it's amazing how many forms don't do that. And it just makes life quicker and easier for the user, particularly on mobile because they're not typing. Um, and then in Gravity Forms, you can use conditional fields. So you can say if somebody's filled out the last field with a certain answer, response or pick something, don't show this field. So if you don't need, for example, on this particular ice cream sundae builder, you can choose to have your ice cream sundae ingredients delivered to your house in a refrigerated box, or you can choose to come into the store and eat it there and have it made up for you ready and you sort of book a slot. Um, it's all very imagine, imaginary, but you know, if you're choosing to come into the store and eat it there, they don't, we don't need your address. So it uses a conditional field in Gravity Forms that says if you've chosen that option, don't ask for the person's address. So they don't, that's another thing they don't have to type in. So anything to reduce the amount of typing. Um, next step on this was to integrate PayPal. Um, as I mentioned, I've got a developer's license for Gravity Forms, so that's really easy. I won't go through all the details of, of setting up PayPal on that because it involves going back and forth between PayPal and so forth, and you won't be able to see anything on the screen. Um, but that's, you know, that means I didn't have to go through a whole e-commerce bloated plugin. I could just do it with that one form. And then the next thing that's really important, um, and that's sometimes a bit trickier on mobile is to actually give feedback to the user. You're on a small screen, they might not see that things have changed once they've actually done something or submitted a form. So it's really important to actually tell them that they, they've done it and what happens next. Um, on desktop you might use a pop-up for that, but on this particular site I've added an extra, an extra page that people are taken to once they've completed the form. And Gravity Forms gives you the option of, of using a pop-up or just putting a message up um, or going to a completely separate page. So in this case I've added a thank you for your order page, which also includes a map of how to get to the store. Um, dependent on whether you said you wanted it delivered to you or whether you said you wanted to come in and either pick it up or eat it in store. Um, so you then tap on that, it takes you until iOS 6, it would take you into the Google Maps app, but now it would take you into the Google Maps web app, their website, and you'd be able to find the store based on where you are. So by accessing Google Maps, that makes that really easy. The thing I haven't worked out yet is actually how to access the new Maps app, the iOS Maps app, because I haven't looked at the API for that. But I'm sure somebody will build a plugin for it at some point to make life easier for all of us. Even map press, yeah. Specify uh, whether you show directions or not. Yeah. Uh, so it will pick up where you are by your IP address. Yeah. And then give it a direction from there. Yeah. But it doesn't show you both on the map. It probably won't on the map because it's too small. Yeah. Yeah. It will show on that map there, there'll be a button that says directions. And you can click it. Right. It directions. Okay. It's a big space. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the next thing will be linking to different maps apps depending on platform, and everything gets more complicated. But sticking to Google is probably the best for the time being. 
Um, so some other options and sort of things for the, that are just coming up and things for the future that you can, you can do through mobile browsers that we've previously done in native apps. Um, file upload, uh, upload, as I've now mentioned, is now available with iOS 6. Now, it's called file upload, but it's not. It's image upload because you have no file management system on an iOS device. There is nothing that you could upload except a photo. But the great thing is, you know, I've this website that I've showed you up the top here is actually a website I built when I was on holiday this year. There was a gang of 20 of us in a house in the middle of nowhere and people kept, kept getting lost trying to find their way back to the house. So I said, oh, I'll build a website and it will show you where it is and wherever you are, you can find your way home. And I also then started to put in it what, what people were doing each day and then it became, can we have a gallery rate so we can upload photos of what everybody's done when they're drunk in the evenings? So we had this gallery, but the only way to upload them via mobile was on the WordPress app on my phone. I added a form where people could upload a photo if they're on their desktop, but people didn't like that because they were using their mobile to take the photos and then have to transfer them onto the desktop and upload them via the website. And they were on holiday, for God's sake. So I, one, of the, one of the guys asked me about this and I said, I'm really sorry, it's not my fault, it's the browser. You can't upload anything in the browser at the moment, but now you can. So next year, because I've already been asked to do another one for next year, um, next year people will be able to upload their daft photos of me doing things when I'm drunk, which is all password protected, so you won't be able to see it um, using, using the browser. Some other um, options that um, I haven't explored but, it, but are you know, possible is local storage, um, web video and audio APIs. The web audio API is new in iOS 6. Um, now that's different from just the audio tag, it's rich audio that you could use to build an app that's almost game-like or something like that using rich audio together with rich video content. Um, you've got canvas and drag and dot drop you can use for interactivity and so forth. You know, HTML, HTML5 stuff that's really powerful that you can be doing in mobile browsers that you know, a lot of people have been doing using native apps. And then location dependent content. Um, this site, similar to the plumber one I told you about, is for locksmiths. Same idea, tap the number to call them and you get your local locksmith um, that we developed. So there's, there's a lot of possibilities of things that you can do using web apps that, that we might assume that you can only do using a native app and it's only going to grow, it's only going to get better as the browsers catch up with the technology. So to sum up, I think web apps are the future of apps. I don't think they're the only future of apps, I think there will always be a place for native apps, but I think as there will come a tipping point when more and more web apps are developed and people's awareness of web apps becomes greater and people start to actually look for web apps and not just native apps. And also when the ordinary people out there know what the difference is between a web app and a website, we might need to rebrand it a little bit because it is confusing. Um, so finally, the plug time. Um, if I've written a book, WordPress Mobile Web Development, if you would like to buy a copy. Um, it's £30.99 from the publisher, but I'm selling it for 20 quid here tonight. Um, and I'm also just yesterday signed contracts to work on two more books. One is for Wiley with Johnny Albert, who some of you might know because he's part of the WordPress UK core group. We're doing a book called WordPress Pushing the Limits, which is an advanced WordPress book for WordPress press professionals. Um, and I'm also um, working as a co-author on the update to WordPress theme, theme design and development beginner's guide for Pact. Both of those will hopefully be out around May next year. So uh, keep your eye out for those. And then finally, as I promised you, the link to these slides, that's the QR code and the short code for the post on my blog with these slides in it. Um, so if you want any of those links to plugins and so forth, please go in there and, um, and you can access them from that page. Can you take some questions? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if time. Have to go into practice, so. Okay. Anyone got any questions? Thanks, Rachel. Um, you mentioned a bit about Gravity Forms. I know that's not strictly what your talk was about. I know, they didn't pay me to give this no, talk, honest. I just, I just, I just like just, Gravity Forms. Uh, I'm intrigued by Gravity Forms because I've had mixed stuff about it. You've obviously used it a bit. I use it a lot. Um, two questions. Um, does it do adequate validation considering, you know, considering what you might be doing with the data once it's someone presses submit? Can you put validation on it? 
massive age. You will yeah. struggle to find a find of that 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 will get really for If you look into the API a bit, yeah. what you can you put the hooks for it, everything, it's Incredible. It's, it's one of the best plugins you will find to work with. Thank you. And the second part of my question, which you perhaps not won't be surprised to hear, do you know whether or not the forms actually are marked up right for accessibility? I'm pretty sure they are. Yeah. But what, yeah. what I've done with them, they are. Right, okay. Yeah. Excellent. I can't vouch for all uh, the possibilities. Uh, but you know, I check through what I've done and they, they are. Even if there's yeah. a bug, it doesn't be you, through the API, you can literally customize the way yeah. in what form would, would add up um, every time or you know, there's, there's very little limit to what you can do with that plugin. It's incredible. The amount of use you can find for it. Mm. <laughs> and you can also use it in five minutes to put up quite a, a good yeah, complex form fairly yeah. easily, yeah. which is what I did with that site when I was on holiday. I did that while everybody was eating their breakfast. It's $199 for a lifetime developer's license, and I've used it on yeah. a lot of sites. I've definitely got my money's worth from it. That's I'm that's the money from, from Gravity Forms. <laughs> um, on, on the mobile app upload, if, I don't know if it works on iOS uh, uh, six because uh, I don't even want to go there. Uh, <laughs> My app is a Google Drive or a box or a Dropbox account or whatever. I mean, it doesn't mind anyway. It goes straight to it. It gives you a selection. Where do you want to put this photo? Right, it's, I don't know about that, I mean when I've used it, it takes you to, you can use your photo stream or your, um, let's have a look, um, the photo stream or the camera roll, I don't, it depends how you've got your photos set up. Yeah. I don't know. So on that, for example, I'll just take the photo, it comes up with share. Obviously I can't share everybody else. Right, see. So it tells you where you want to put it then. So you've got your box. What's that in the middle? Yeah, I mean that's, that's, that's an Android, because that doesn't have photo upload on it yet anyway. Because Android doesn't have photo upload yet. Photo upload don't think. where? On, in the browser. No, it's not the browser, it's just a photo itself. Yeah, it's but... Photo and then it uploads it wherever you want it to upload. Yeah, but what this is about is, take, is having a photo that you've already taken on your phone, or you're about to take on your phone. You're in a website, and you want to upload it to that website. So say if you're in... If you're in Gravatar, and you want to change your Gravatar. Um, I don't... I haven't used Gravatar on a mobile, but, you know. And you want to change your Gravatar, you could take a photo of yourself mm -hmm. and upload it in the browser straight away. Um, that's different from where you want to store it. It's not actually about storage, it's about yes, uploading it device. from your device to to the website. Mm -hmm. So it could be useful for a social media app where you, people want to upload a profile picture or something like that, or for um, if you were a band and you wanted people to take photos of your gigs and upload them onto your website. You could do that without having to go through Flickr or whatever. It just makes it quicker and easier, I think. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. I'm just interested in the sort of definition you have of the web app opposed to certain responsive design. Mm. So maybe in a real life situation where the user kind of goes from being on a responsive side on their mobile to the web app, kind of what, what sort of makes that happen? I think it's based on what the client needs their mobile visitors to do. Uh, so say for example if you were doing a site for a train company and you wanted them to use the mobile site to book tickets not to do researching how to take their bike on the train and all that sort of stuff which you might do on the desktop site I would serve up a mobile theme to mobile users but give them the option to switch to the desktop site the idea being that it means that as soon as you're in the site on a mobile you're straight into the process that the owner of the website wants you to complete because that's what their website is about. Whereas on desktop, because you've got all that screen real estate, you can put that over on one side and have some content in the middle. Uh, yeah, so I can just still see the confusion where, where you work with, say, a site that's responsive as well. Yeah. So you've got to click on to see the main site, you expect to see the site on <laughs> your desktop computer, but then you go to a mobile, you have a responsive site, which kind of. Yeah. 
I mean, see, because to me, to me, a responsive site is has got different content to your web app because the web, the, the the navigation on this site is completely different on the mobile theme and effectively to a user the content of your site is the navigation because that's how they get around and find things. What's actually in your database is irrelevant to the user, it's what they can find and, and see. So when they go into the responsive site they get the same navigation and the same content that they get in the desktop site but they just get it served up to them in a way that's easier to interact with on a, mo on a mobile. I guess it's the whole, some people don't like responsive sites anyway because they prefer to look at desktop site and zoom in. I'm not one of those people. Um, I'm a big fan of responsive sites. But, I, I, but there is a debate going on around how do we actually give users the option to switch from media queries and turn them off. Um, and I, I'm not going there because I can't see the point. Um, but you know there are some people have been saying yeah, we, we ought to do this so that if people want to they can look at our dirty grey desktop site in their mobile. Um, I just think that as more and more people get used to interacting with responsive sites they're not really going to notice and if you design it well it sort of becomes invisible in a way I think. Yes. From the packed website and from Amazon yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much it. I think it's a bit less as an ebook. I think it's about sixteen as an ebook. Yeah, I was going to say, looking at that, and obviously kind of touching on what you said. Would what would you not? Um, do you, because in, in my mind, what I think, well, okay, I see the um, in terms of the production of this, I see the benefit of building it once. But if you're going to have a mobile site or a responsive site and a web app. Then you, you're not that far away from having a native app. Wouldn't wouldn't it be more um, kind of intuitive for the user to have the, the web app within the responsive mobile um, or the, within the responsive site if it's a core function for a training company? Well, the default and the default for this, if somebody's on a mobile, would be the web app. <laughs> Right. So when they when they first launch the site on a mobile, they wouldn't see the responsive site, they'd see the web app. But they get the option to switch to the main site, which is the responsive site. And to be honest, part of the reason that this works like that is because the process I went through with it for the book was to build a, res build a desktop site, make it responsive, then, uh, then build a web app based on it. But I, as I was doing that, I thought I would prefer if I was in a web app and I switched to the main site to actually get a, web, a main site that was easy to interact with and was responsive. And I think, you know, it does add a bit more work, but I don't think it adds as much more work as if you have to code a native app for lots of different devices. Because, um, you know, you're talking about four or five different native apps now. It used to be one or two, but it's as the number of decent smartphones grows, that's going to get harder and harder to manage.